Enjoy mathematics. Let's um, let's just take a look at this quick and just in your own mind quietly. Just look up here and make sure these are all right. And if that's not true, then just quietly alert us with your hand raised. Tell me if there's any wrong. You see up there? Are those the answers you had? Anything you want to say about those? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think I like them. Is there anything else that you want to say about the warm-up, like, at all? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, we thought that we were K-H and A-H, so who else is K-H? Oh, great. You know what we've just illustrated? A, a function that's not one-to-one, -one, right? This is, this, is a, this is an input. <laughs> this is an input that has two outputs or more, possibly, in this room, right? Isn't this wonderful? Okay. Um, that was my bad. All right. Well, that's cool. Who, who else is? Who, who put these up? A. Alice Cooch. Ah, oh, you guys should be friends. Okay. And then, um, <laughs> and uh, who else is K H? Oh, I'm K H. You're K H. You're K. Uh, Cameron. Yeah. And you're. Cameron. Cameron and Caden. Yeah. See, there you go. You guys should be friends. Okay. Perfect. Anyone else? K H and H in here. I had a class. I had a class last year that had like five <laughs> JCs. Oh no! All right. So I have I have a remarkable I have a remarkable picture to show you. Okay. So uh, I, this this past summer I was down in like Alexandria area and um, a friend a friend of mine we were going to this kind of like second run movie theater uh, and. It's, it was cool. It's pretty amazing. Uh, they have like kind of lesser known movies as well, and so maybe I, I mean I don't know the whole story on this, but I was just amazed to see this. Okay, because what we saw is a sign that said this, and I was like, wait, what? So it kind of took me a second because I was like, wait a sec, that's like one of the units we do in pre calculus. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was kind of startling, and so I just so I decided to take a picture to show you. Didn't ask what? What it was about. I didn't ask too many questions. I should have, though. Yeah, maybe I should call them up. Um, I bet it would have been, like, awesome. Because I think that that's what's going to be true of our unit here. All right. So um, as we start this unit, too, you have a green sheet. And at the beginning of every unit, I will give you a homework sheet like this that has on the back all the homework that we'll do. Tonight is homework one, which I won't actually check until Tuesday. Okay, because we have a quiz tomorrow. Um, but whenever I write one in a circle on the board, you know that that means homework one is in the sheet, and I don't have to write any more information. You'll know, okay? So they're in the book. You don't have to bring your book to school because you'll have it at home, and you can just do those assignments at your leisure. Okay. What else was I going to say? Something. Make note also on there of the three dates that I put on there as well. So next Friday we actually have a quiz already too. So. It won't always come that rapid fire, but you know, there it is. This first unit of the year we're going to be discussing, it says graphs of functions is the name of the unit. Uh, so, and as you look down some of the topics and objectives and things that the homeworks will cover, some of those things will sound familiar, but you'll just have to trust me. I promise that I will challenge you. If I'm not challenging you, then come, come, let me know. I will challenge you. I can do it. Yeah. Is the quiz tomorrow just on the summer stuff? Yes, sir. Yeah. So if you feel good and you have all your questions answered about the summer packet, I think you're probably going to do it. Be a I'm going to give you all period, but I don't think you'll need all period. So let's start today with just kind of a short catalog of some features that we might encounter in graph ways of talking about them in precise language. Right? We'd like to talk about continuity in particular. We'd like to talk about increasing and decreasing behavior, boundedness, extrema, and symmetry, and end behavior. Also, I guess it should be on that list. There are a couple things we're going to talk about there. Um, and I have a gift for you that I will, please do not get used to this. We will be taking notes in this class quite a bit, okay? But, but today, in particular, I have, because I've got like a whole bunch of definitions for you, I just didn't think that was like a really good use of time to be writing them down. So here they are. They're just reproduced from the book. There's nothing like fancy about this. 
I'd rather us like take the time to think about them. I'd rather take the time to think about them and discuss them and analyze them and use them in the graphs than like mindlessly writing them down. Come back, please. All right. So let's talk about continuity right, for, right from the beginning. Uh, we'll wait for calculus for a really rigorous de definition. This one might not be very satisfying to you, but there it is. It's on your paper, too. You can draw it without picking up your pencil. Do you like that definition? Maybe it's like I said. If you're a mathematician, you're probably not satisfied with that definition. Uh, but everyone right now, I mean, I have one up here that's not very interesting, right? But right now, everyone draw a function, please. You don't have to know the rule, but right, just anywhere, 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 on your hand if you like, anywhere, just draw me a function without picking up your pencil and, and we'll call that continuous. Just see if you can come up with the one that's interesting. It doesn't have to be one you know the rule for. Doesn't, please try to make it not look like mine though, right? Like that would be, be more fun. It would be more fun if it didn't look like mine. All right, show, show the result to your neighbor. It shouldn't take more than, you know, a few seconds to draw a graph like that. Um, I want to. I want to come see what you got here. Here, here's one I just saw that I liked. Look at this. Look at that. What do you think of that one? What? I like that. All right. Is that a good one? What do you think? You like that? Any, uh, anyone else have a really cool one? I mean, the point is, if you kind of have sharp edges, you kind of have right, so whatever. Uh, I mean, if we're if we're asking if we're asking that it be a function, then you know, if it's a function, if it's going to be a function, then it needs to at least pass the vertical line test. If we're drawing like a function of x. Then, then we might want that to be true. Um, so, but other than that, you know, it can be have jagged edges, it can have smooth edges, whatever you want. All right, how can things be discontinuous? Can you have some kind of discontinuity? Yeah, now that we have this in mind, are there places that uh, can still have a function that has some kind of discontinuity? And so here are the three different classifications we might put a discontinuity into, into these categories. And, um, and it's possible that you could have one that would be hard to name in one of these categories. It's kind of a combination, maybe too. But these give us some general, some general language to describe the kinds of ways a function could be discontinuous, right? And these are on your sheet, except now I have some pictures for you as well. Did you have a comment? Sorry. Yes. I'm gonna post this on headline after we're done, so you can watch again if you're absolutely right. Right. I mean, let me ask you this. Good question. Stop talking. Good question over here. What about a horizontal asymptote? Does that count as an infinite discontinuity? Because there's like something infinite happening there. So is that an infinite discontinuity? Well, let me ask you this. Can you draw? Think of, can you give me a function that has a horizontal asymptote? Go. What's the name of it? So, like, what's the function that has a horizontal asymptote? Give me one. Yeah, it was complicated. All right, good. Um, yeah. I mean, how about 
how about just like uh, how about just two to the x? Okay, one over x. So it, 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 does the horizontal asymptote contribute to any of its discontinuous behavior? Um, I mean, you can think of two to the x as an example. Is two to the x the exponential function? Two to the x is that a continuous function? Yeah. Does it have a horizontal asymptote? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So, so no, actually, they, the, the only thing we care about here is vertical asymptotes as far as discontinuity goes. Um, so up here, we talk about removable discontinuity as being one that could be, uh, if you were just to fix one value of the function, you'd be, it would be continuous subset, right? Like if we changed f of 3 and reassigned the value of f of 3 to be like 7, suddenly it's been fixed, right? Does that make sense? Like all we'd have to do is this, there's, it's undefined here. All we'd have to do is define it to be that point and suddenly it's continuous. Or over here, if we were redefining this value to be here, it would be continuous. These, you'd have to change down here, you'd have to change lots of x values, the y values that go with them to fix the discontinuity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so in fact, actually, right now, everyone draw a picture of a function that has all three kinds of discontinuities. Ready to go. <laughs> Again, no need to have like a rule. Yeah, in one function, one function that has all three kinds of discontinuities. Right? One, well, I mean, of course you're going to pick up your pencil to draw this one because these we're going to be drawing examples of discontinuities, <laughs> right? So therefore, if you if you didn't pick up your pencil, you're doing it wrong. Right. Um. You can put them wherever you want. You can draw them wherever you like. <laughs> All right, yeah, I mean, I see lots of things out there. Show it to your neighbors, see what you guys got. Um, good stuff. Uh, well, while I'm thinking of it, how about, what about this? Um, if you were to draw a picture like this, and actually, I think I might know a function that has this kind of shape, actually. Um, tell me about this function. Yes? True. True. So, yeah, but it is continuous, isn't it? So I just want to make sure you understand that, like, if infinite discontinuity, then we mean there's a vertical asymptote there. But if vertical asymptote, then not necessarily discontinuity, right? Because here this has a vertical asymptote, but no discontinuities, right? So just want to make sure the logic's clear on that, yeah. There's a vertical asymptote on one side. Yep. Of our, of our line and then something else on the other side, like, is the point or whatever, is it still infinite? Yeah, like that or something, say we had yeah. a function like that. I mean, that's where I don't know, what do you want to call that? I, I might still call it an infinite like discontinuity, I don't know. Okay. That one maybe doesn't fall neatly into one of these categories, yeah. What if it was just a point? You mean if it had just like, just a point here or something, yeah. defined on the axis? That would be perfectly fine. Right, it would still be discontinuity. It would be a di that, that's a discontinuity, though, right? Yeah. So I don't know whether I answer your question. Too. This is a perfectly good function I've just drawn a picture of, right? I don't know like how you want to name this discontinuity right here, though. Is that a jump discontinuity? I don't know. It's not a removable discontinuity because you can't just fix it with one point. Anyway, moving smartly along. Let's talk about horizontal and vertical asymptotes for a second, okay? So I know you know what a horizontal and vertical asymptote is, but let's maybe maybe you haven't used this language to describe them. So if we're talking about horizontal asymptotes, then this might be a good like rigorous definition. If you haven't used this notation before, I'd like you to start being familiar with it, please. Uh, and even if you haven't seen it before, I think you're probably familiar. Like you can probably read it and not know what it means, right? Let's read this out loud. This says that a line y equals b. We call that a horizontal asymptote if one of these two things, but not necessarily both, are true, right? If the limit, this is how you read this out loud, loud. if the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x equals some number b, right, some real number b, like 5 or something, if that limit as x goes out to infinity uh, of the function equals 5, then that means it has a horizontal, a horizontal asymptote of y equals 5, right? Um, 
And by limit as x goes to infinity, we mean plug in a million into your function. Plug in a billion into your function. Plug in a trillion. What y values are you getting? Are they getting uh, closer to 5 always? OK, well, then you have a cardinal asymptote of y equals 5, if that makes sense. Uh, or the other side, too, if you're approaching negative 30. So we just talked about the exponential function a minute ago. That's an example of a function that for only one of these statements is satisfied, but yet we still call that a horizontal asymptote, right? It only exhibits this limiting behavior on one side of the function, doesn't it? Okay, so one or the other, or both, like the rational function, some of you are talking about a rational function like that too. Vertical asymptotes we can say in this like technical language also, um, but I need to maybe talk about what this minus and plus means a little bit here. So what do we mean by a vertical asymptote? We claim x, x right, equals a, is a vertical line that's an asymptote if one or both of these is satisfied. Okay, So the way we read this out loud, this first one, for example, is the limit as x approaches the number a from the left. That's what the minus means. Like It's like, up, like almost like an exponent, right? A, like to the min a to the negative or something. That's not how we read it, though. We read it as x approaches a from the left. Or over here, x approaches a from the right. So that's what we mean. As x gets closer and closer to the number 3, as you're plugging 3, 2.9 in, 2.999 in, 2.999999 in, are you getting y values that are like enormous, and that are going really, 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 really big, going to infinity? Well, then you have an asymptote. Or are they going getting really big, negatively big? Are you getting numbers like negative a million? OK, that's also an asymptote. Either one, plus or minus infinity here. OK, that would also be true on the right side, though, too. You have an as a vertical asymptote of x equals 3. If you're coming from the right side and putting numbers like 3.1 in, 3.000001 in, 3.000000001 in, and you're getting large or really negatively large values, then that's an asymptote. Is that clear? Is that a good technical way to say that? Um, I don't know if you've had that language before in your book. I haven't read it. Um, if an asymptote, does it have any points on it, then why would you say that it equals 3 or equals? Yeah, and the up here on the horizontal asymptote. So, so, so the limit, we're not saying f will take on the value b necessarily. We're just saying that in the limit, it will get closer to that value b, right? So take the, take the example that we're talking about. We'll look at this guy right here for the function uh, to, to the x, for example. All right, so what I'm saying is as, as x goes toward negative infinity, like as you plug in values like negative a million, what kinds of values are you getting for y? The answer is like values really close to zero, right? All right, so if that's true, if they get progressive, if the limit of those values approaches zero, then we write zero here. And we say the hard last node is y equals zero. I mean, this, this particular function will not take on the value zero ever, right? Yeah, so the asymptote is defined to be that l whatever that limiting process comes out to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, we should clear up one other misconception, which I think you might have, and that is that you can't have a function cross its horizontal asymptote, right? But you may, right? Yeah. So, like, you can have a function like, uh, like this or something like that, you know? Right? This, this approaches zero over here, but it does actually take on the value of the fast and over here too, doesn't it? So that's okay. So, I mean, we're starting to talk about end behavior a little bit too here, so let's say that. Uh, end behavior kind of ties in a little bit with this horizontal asymptote idea, so let's say it. Um, we can describe the end behavior of a function using these two statements, the limit as x approaches infinity and negative infinity. These are the ones actually we were just using up here. And these two statements describe what we call as the left and the right end behavior of a function. Okay. So uh, sometimes a might be or b might be a number like 5, but it also could be that we might, we're going to allow you to make a and b numbers like negative and, and negative positive infinity. Okay. And that will help us describe graphs like these right here. So let's actually do that right now with these two graphs. Um, I, want, I want, that is to say, I want to fill in the blanks here. Tell me what the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is equals what? And the limit as x approaches positive infinity 
of f of x. Tell me the answer to both of those questions. And answer the same two questions over here. The limit as x goes toward negative infinity and positive infinity. Okay, so I want the answers to both of those questions for both of those problems. And I want, um, I'm going to pick different people to answer. So I just want you to fill in the blanks here. Do you understand what I'm asking? Rachel, where are you? Yeah, hi Rachel. So what do you think? What would you... Both of these here, tell me. No, what? Oh, Lee. Where are you? Rachel Lee. Yeah, go. Yeah, so I told you you can put negative infinity as an answer here, right? Do you see, do you see this? Okay, all right. And then. Also negative infinity? Cool, all right. Those can be the same answer for this function. That's what's happening. Yeah? So that describes. I, I, yeah, like I said, maybe you even had this kind of discussion a little bit in your algebra 2 class. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, then, but right? Maybe you might have written a little bit differently, but but same idea. Yeah, just, yeah you might have actually written as x arrow infinity y yeah, yeah, arrow yeah, negative yeah, infinity. Yeah. Yeah. Like All right, so it's, this is exactly, exactly exactly the same thing. Okay, it's just a slightly different notation, which might be making you uncomfortable. Yeah. Let me get the answers to the other one, and then I'll get to yeah. your question. Sabrina, give me the other. Where are you, Sabrina? Give me the answers to the other two. Just fill in the legs. Zero and positive infinity. Great. And that tells me that this has a horizontal asymptote, too, of y equals zero. By definition, because that's what we defined a horizontal asymptote to be, right? It's, it's if this limit comes out to be some finite value, then it must, it must be a horizontal asymptote. And notice that this particular horizontal asymptote is actually crossed multiple times, right? And that's okay. Okay? Yeah, I think, like I said, let's, let's say it again. I think that's a misconception that some of you might have that you can't cross a horizontal asymptote, but that's just not true. Okay. What's that? You wouldn't necessarily be able to tell by looking at a function if it's going to cross its asymptote. Yeah. Um, for the horizontal asymptote notation, why is it like equals b? Because like, if it's a horizontal asymptote, then it's yeah, so it's not that the function equals b, it's that the limit of the whole function. So that's, you know what I'm saying? So this whole thing is equal to zero. It's not necessarily true, though, like I just talked about, this actually does take on the value zero too, but that's not really what we're talking about. Forget the stuff that happens here. What we're really talking about is what happens out, out at negative infinity. Yeah? So if it crosses at like three times, then so the only thing we care about when it comes to horizontal asymptotes is you plugging in really, really, really big numbers, right? And that's the big question is, what happens when you plug in negative a million, negative a billion, negative a trillion? Are you getting a number closer to zero? Done. Then you have an asymptote, right? A horizontal asymptote. And whether it crosses is neither here nor there, right? Okay, increasing and decreasing behavior. We want to say something about that. I think intuitively you might have an idea of what we mean by increasing and decreasing. But here's a technical definition that we might use as a, our working definition. And we're going to think of increasing and, and decreasing as in terms of like intervals. So this, a function increases on an interval. If you claim that a function increases on the interval 0 to 10, say, then it must be true that any two points that I pick inside your interval, like you can't dictate to me which point. I can pick any two points I like. If you claim that it increases on the interval 0 to 10, then any two points I pick, it should be true that, um, that uh, a positive change in x results in a positive change in f of x, right? Or said similar, said but maybe in a more easy, in an easier way. The point on the right should be higher, right? Uh, if, it's, if you claim it's increasing. That should be true for any two points, I think, if you claim it's increasing on a certain interval. Uh, likewise for decreasing. Or said, said another way, uh, if you put a little man on top of the function and have him walk always left to right, left to right, left to right, um, is he going uphill or downhill, right? That's the other way to think about it, too. And then it's constant if it's constant, if there's no change in, in one. Did I see a hand somewhere? Probably good. Okay. So I think that's a concept that you've thought about a little bit before, but do you remember this minute point about the definition? It's actually going to come into play right now, too. Just be careful as you use this definition to answer these questions. I don't mean them to be super tricky or anything, but let's take a look at these two functions. I want you to name 
the increasing and decreasing intervals on these two functions. So I'll pick someone at random to tell me what uh, what kind of increasing and decreasing behavior part A has. How about Lisa? Tell me if there's any increasing. Are there any intervals of increasing on this function or decreasing? You tell me. Um, zero. Okay, zero to infinity. And what is what's going on there? That's is increasing on the interval zero to infinity. Any decreasing intervals or is okay. Good, okay. And then let's take a volunteer on the next one here. I think I'm satis satisfied with that. You want to do the next one, Rose? Okay. Um, so from negative infinity to negative three, it's, it's negative two, actually, but whatever, it doesn't matter. It's negative 2.3, we can call it whatever we like. It's increasing, and then from negative two, three, whatever that is, to zero, it's increasing. Okay. I'm going to call it two, but I don't know, whatever. You can call it three if you want. No, isn't that over three? I don't know. It's hard to tell. I meant it to be two here, but maybe it's 2.2 .2 or something. Whatever. Just go with me. Okay, okay. Did you learn about increasing and decreasing? Yes, I did. All right, good. Well, then let's just call it a day. Forget my, uh, my PowerPoint graphic skills. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what about zero, the point zero, yeah, zero? In yeah, so would you like to include that? You could actually, I'll be a little flexible on that one. You definitely want, don't want to include negative two and positive two because it's, it's not even defined there. So let's not do that. But the question that he's raising, uh, Judah is raising, is that is, is could you have a closed bracket on zero here and here? And the answer is, eh, sure, whatever you want to do. I don't really care too much. Because right now, we've defined increasing and decreasing behavior to be a function of the interval, right? So if you were to ask, is a function increasing or decreasing at a particular, at a particular point, one point, right now that's meaningless for us. Because we haven't, but that is an interesting question that we'll talk about in calculus. Like, is the function increasing or decreasing at zero? What do you think? It's like neither or, or both? Wait for calculus for more discussion about that, right? Are you going to teach us calculus? No, no, sorry. I'll try not to say wait for calculus. It's like last year, it was wait for pre-calculus. Wait for pre-calculus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just say, well, wait till you go to college. Then you'll really know. Let's talk about an idea that I don't think you have heard a lot about. It's called boundedness. The definitions are on your, on your sheet. So let me just say why these pictures encapsulate these definitions fairly well. All right, so a function is said to be bounded below if, if there's a number that you can plot, like a, maybe the easiest way to do it was with this picture. If there's a number that the range never goes down below, right? So if you can plot this horizontal line, any horizontal line, right, below the function, and the function never crosses it, then the function must be bounded below, right? Uh, bounded above would be like the opposite. Can you draw a horizontal line over your function? And is your function always staying below that line? Then your function must be bounded above, right? And if it's, if you could do both, if you could draw a line up below and above, and it never goes outside those two lines, then your function is both bounded above and below. You might just call it bounded. Okay, so is that okay? Does that make sense? These, this is kind of maybe a little bit of a new idea, um, but it's not, I don't mean it to be super hard. Um, but that's what we mean by bounded. By bounded, we mean the range of the function is bounded. Okay. And, you'll, and you'll hear people say that, right, in other contexts too, even like a news article, like, like uh, the growth of the, the population in the fish in the pond is bounded. Right, what do they mean by that? They mean like the function that dictates the population will never go below certain amount and never above a certain amount. It's bounded, right? Um, or they might say, this this function increases without bound or something, right? And that means it's not bounded above, maybe, is what that means. You know. uh, okay, let's talk about extrema a little bit here. So by a local maximum or a local minimum, do, we know, do you know what we mean by that? Yes. Um, we could also talk about it as being a relative local, uh, a relative maximum or a relative minimum. 
And those things mean in their neighborhood or in some open interval containing that point, right? So if you're a local maximum, then there is some open interval containing you for which you are the largest value, right? If you're the largest value for the whole function, though, then you're also called the absolute or the global maximum. So on this picture here, if you were to name these points, I have three points here, A, B, and C, label, you know, if you were to label those. Can you tell me something about one of those? What, tell me something that you know about those. Yeah. C is the absolute So C, if we're calling this one C, then C is the absolute minimum because there's no point below it. Yeah. Even though, say something else about that. A is also a minimum, but the local minimum because if you were to like restrict it to some open interval around it containing it, it would be the lowest value in its neighborhood, right? Yeah. That doesn't seem like a useful definition because every point is a local maximum. Is that true? That's a good question. So I, I said an open interval containing the point, right? Well, if you put the interval such that the point is at, is at one edge, then yes, it could be. I said an open interval containing oh, so the point. Can you think of an open interval? Like, uh, so for example, you know, like, um, take, I think you're claiming that, for instance, y equals x by this definition, like the point right here at 1, 1 is a local minimum, for example. OK, so give me an interval containing the number 1, right? Like, I don't know, what would you like it to be? No, an open interval containing 1. An open interval, not like closed, right? Like with parentheses. Give me an open interval uh, that one contains one. one. What is it? One that doesn't contain one, though. One, the interval one to three doesn't contain one. Oh, I see. Right. So this is the big. That's. It's actually maybe you didn't realize how critical the open piece was, right? Yeah. So now, is this the lowest value in that interval? No. Yeah. So that's that's actually like a really fine point, but it's an important one. I like I like that we are having this discussion. Um, what about uh, what about point B? What the one in the middle? If we're calling it B, yes, yeah, local max. Is there a lo uh, is there an absolute max? No. Do we have to have one? No. Uh, what about C? Can it also be thought of as a local minimum? Yes. Not just not just the absolute minimum. Sure, because if I'm the tallest math if I'm the tallest teacher in the entire building, you are. Yeah. I'm the tallest teacher, I think I am actually. Then I'm also the tallest math teacher, right? Like I'm also the tallest in my neighborhood. If I'm the tallest in the world, then I'm the definitely the tallest in my neighborhood also, right? So, it's like so. Venn diagrams. Yeah, it's really exactly. Open. It's like a Venn diagram. Well, let's talk about symmetry. Don't pack up on me. I see some of you being anxious to pack up. You're not allowed to pack up. I promise this is the last thing we want to say something about. Let me, let me still have you here. All right, so we want to talk about two kinds of symmetry that we're really interested in. And again, this might be somewhat new to you as well. Let's say something about this idea of being even. A function is even if it has symmetry over the y-axis. OK? Is that OK? And what about this odd if it has symmetry with respect to the origin? And by that, we mean that you could even you could think about that as a reflection through the origin. Or you could say it's a rotation, 180 degree rotation around the origin. And those are the only two kinds of symmetry for a graph that we really care about right now. Uh, the part I really want to draw your attention to is this algebraic piece, though, right here, right? This one, I think, is pretty clear, the even definition. If you plug in negative 5 and 5, you get the same answer, right? Yeah. That's what it means to be even. This one's a little harder to see. Let me put some points on the graph here, right? But if you plug negative 5 into your function and 5 into your function, then you get two values that are the, the opposite, right? You get 10 and negative 10 or something like that. So that's what this is saying, but it's a little hard to see. Do you see it? And if that's true, then it's odd. And we don't, uh, and I guess, no, I still want you for two more minutes. Okay, here. So I want to actually sh see if you can do this without looking at without looking at the graph, right? In fact, actually, looking at the graph is not a proof, is it? All right, so this first one I think you might be able to tell, though. Is this even or odd? What do you think? It's even, you think? Okay, well, how do we prove it? Here's how you prove that it's even. You think, okay, well, what's f of negative x? What is f of negative x? Well, that's 3 times negative x to the fourth plus 5 
which is equal to 3 times x to the fourth plus 5, which is equal to f of x. Therefore, it's even by the definition of evenness, right? And I don't want you to just plug in negative 5 and 5. I want you to plug in negative x, right? And see that it's true for all values. Does that make sense? Because it could just be a fluke that negative 5 and 5 pop, pop out the same value, right? Okay, let's keep going. What about this guy? What do you think this one is? Uh, let's see. Let's try it. Let's plug in negative t and see what happens. All right, so what happens here? Negative t to the fifth is also known as negative 2t to the fifth. Can we write that? And down here, this is negative t to the third plus t. Okay. I'm still not seeing anything, though. Oh, wait, wait, hold up. Can I like, yeah, can I take out the negative out of the bottom maybe? Let's see. So what is this? So what is this? This is a reminder. Put a lock on a locker that was not this assigned to you. Too. You have until the end of right. today. That is the end of today to remove right. your lock, or you'll be cut off by security. You can go now. I love you. Bye. Place a lock on a locker that was.